Now, because the channel has got blocked, that does not mean the river should get blocked. If the channel is blocked, okay. I try to unblock this channel, it's not getting unblocked. We'll keep trying over here, but let the water move towards through the other channels. So letting go means that we, if a particular relationship is not working out, that doesn't mean we abandon it, but it just means that we don't obsess so much on it that we lose perspective. And this is a service to Krishna, it's an important service to Krishna, but if this service to Krishna doesn't work out, still there are other services like it. Say so if we are trying, if we say distribute books, or if we do classes, or if we do kirtans, or if we do puja, if we do cooking, each one of these is a service to Krishna. And we would like to do it as well as we can. But suppose situations change and a particular service that we are doing, we are no longer able to do that. For whatever reason. Now that doesn't mean that our relationship with Krishna is so. If this service is not possible, there are other services I can do. So when we see a relationship as a service to Krishna, then there can be both responsibility and detachment. How? Responsibility because it's a service to Krishna, let me do it the best that I can. But detachment because I understand that I am not the controller. It is Krishna who is the controller. And if somehow this particular thing is not working out, this channel is blocked, then I will make sure that my other services go on, that the water of my consciousness moves towards Krishna through the other channels. And that way, we can move forward peacefully, even if there is disruption in our life. We may not be peaceful always, but we can at least be purposeful. Okay, this is not working out. This will cause some agitation, but purposefully, we move towards Krishna through whatever services we can do, whatever relationships are moving forward, so we move forward and add no channel stays blocked forever. Eventually, that blockage will also go away. But just because the channel is blocked, channel of our consciousness is blocked, doesn't mean our consciousness should get blocked. We can move forward steadily through the other channels. And by Krishna's plan, eventually that channel will also be unblocked. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of <coughs> focus first on the vertical relationship with Krishna. Look up before we look around. I spoke three points. First is that our defining identity should be, our defining relationship should be our vertical relationship with Krishna, not the horizontal relationships. This is what is eternal. And if we can get strength and stability to that, to that relationship, then even if there are disruptions in the horizontal relationships, we will see them as bumps on the road of life. But if the horizontal relationship itself has become our defining relationship, then a problem with that relationship will seem like the end of the road of life. So that perspective we get when we make the vertical relationship the foremost by practicing bhakti diligently. And second point I talked about is that when we are for when we are acting in the horizontal relationships, we should rather, rather than Feeling our way to actions, we can act our way to the feelings. So, if we try to control how what we feel, how we feel, it's a losing battle. Our feelings are like the weather; it keeps changing unpredictably. But if we feel our way, if instead we take charge of what we do, so love is not just a noun; it's also a verb. It's not just an emotion; it's also an action. So we start acting in the mood of loving service, gradually the connection will develop. And we may want good feelings, but good feelings come temporarily uh, by just doing things which feel good. But good feelings come substantially when we live according to our principles. That connects us at a deeper level. And then the feeling that comes is not superficial and ephemeral but it is substantial and it is spiritual, it is sublime. The last point I talked about is how uh, responsibility means also 
learning when to let go. When attachment is there, then we want the relationship at all costs. And that, sometimes the cost may be just too much, like it happened in Adhutaraj to and Duryodhana. So, to let go means that if we are trying our best, but a particular relationship is getting blocked, then we see that relationship as a service to Krishna, but not as a sole service to Krishna. There is one channel through which our consciousness is meant to flow towards Krishna. If that channel gets blocked, then other channels are still open. And with that, we can, even if that relationship is blocked, we can continue serving Krishna purposefully. And by Krishna's plan in due course, that channel will also get unblocked. And thus, we can responsibly do services in whatever relationships are working, and responsibly we distance ourselves from something which doesn't seem to be working so that we can focus on that which does work. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Who has eyes, sees, S-E-E-S. So S, first S is selflessness. Uh, so there's selflessness, sacrifice, and let's look at this first. So first is if we consider the mood of sacrifice and the mood of selflessness. These are two S beginning and end. But if we consider, say if, if it was the Ram was irresponsible or attached or too reputation conscious, because of that he abandoned Sita. Then he could very well have immediately married someone else. If a person, if a king is in reputation conscious, for that king to uh, have not have any queen with him, that is not a reputation and answer at all. Later on, when Ram had to perform yajnas, the Brahmanas told him, yajnas should performed by the by the husband and wife together. So he said, I will not marry. He had a, he had a golden effigy of Sita made, and he had that seat with her, sit with him. So now, in yajnas, only uh, for doing yajnas, purity is required. So Ram personally considered Sita to be so pure that he would even have an effigy of Sita sit with him for performing yajna. So through both these points, that Ram did not remarry and Ram had Sita's effigy for doing yajnas. That indicates that Ram did not personally reject Sita. Ram personally respected her as his wife. So then, why did he actually abandon Sita at that time? So for a king, it is important to set an example. And what is the example at that, in that particular context? The example was that <coughs> of detachment. So just when the king has the best things best material things to enjoy in life. And when the king follows dharma even in that situation, that inspires others to follow dharma. If the king, despite having material things, adheres to dharma, then others are also inspired. So when this particular rumor started going in, uh, in Ayodhya, that Sita is not pure, Ram had two choices. One is, that he could either neglect or squash that rumor. Mm -hmm. Now, if you squash that rumor, all that would happen by that is it, the people who were circulating that rumor, they would think just see he's so attached. That when we are speaking the truth, he's acting he is abusing his royal power. That would have actually worsened the situation. He could have neglected the rumor, but uh, rumors are, it's dealing with them is a very complicated thing. You sometimes when a, when a fire is lit, if a fire is like a candle, it's a candle's fire. A wind comes, the wind will extinguish the fire. But if there's a big forest fire, that is lit, and the wind comes, then it can spread the fire like anything. I just in America about 15 days ago, so then in California, there was a big fire which has been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And 
Too bad to eat that. Big problem comes in the big ones. So, similarly with respect to rumors. Sometimes the rumor is small, just the passage of time squashes, then the rumor goes away. But sometimes the rumor is like a fire, and as time passes, the rumor simply grows bigger and bigger. So, how to deal with that, only the person in that situation has to decide. It's very difficult for us to judge from our perspective. So, when Ram, well, he in that situation felt that the best way to deal with that rumor would be that he distanced himself from Sita. Now, sometimes we may say that Ram banished Sita. Now, banish is, may not be the most appropriate word for that. Because banishment means, as happened to Ram himself, deep in the forest, out of the kingdom, with no shelter at all. But when Ram sent Sita away from him, she was, he, he arranged for Lakshman to take her right next to the, the hermitage of Valmiki. And in Valmiki, the Valmiki's hermitage was in Ram's kingdom itself. So in that sense, uh, Sita was indirectly still in Ram's protection. So it was just that he distanced himself from her. And this he did so that people would not accuse that the king is attached and use that accusation to rationalize and aggravate their own attachments. So it was actually a great self, greatly selfless act on his part. Ram, it was Ram, he himself was distressed by it. It was not that he got any joy in doing that. Then if we move forwards, this was, as I said, the second point, he is what I was talking about is the ethical dilemma. There are moral dilemmas. Moral dilemma means one option is moral, the other is immoral. If somebody offers somebody a bribe, should I take it or not take it? It just requires moral strength. Don't take it. It's a temptation. But ethical dilemma means there are two courses of action and both of them are good. But which is better? There are two dharmas, both of them are important, but which is priority of so Ram had his dharma as his king and Ram had a dharma as a husband. So Ram at that particular point gave priority to his dharma as a king. He did not reject his dharma as a husband but he subordinated that. And especially uh, in a country like India where nepotism is so common. Nepotism is partiality towards favoritism towards one's own relatives and family members. You know, one politician gets elected, then hundred people from the politician's family, they get appointed in the government and they get flush facilities because of that. So actually Ram's detachment is exemplary for in such a nepotistic culture. So, that, so Ram had an ethical dilemma and he resolved it in the best way he could in that situation. That's e. The third E is this, uh, there are esoteric explanations for this. The Ramayana itself explains that long ago there's a demon who was terrorizing the devtas. And finally, Vishnu along with the devtas turned the odds against this demon and the demon fled. And as the demon was free and Vishnu was chasing him, the demon sought shelter with Khyati. Khyati is the wife of the sage Bhru. And she had a misguided sense of compassion. He said, okay, I'll protect you. And then Vishnu, he came there along with Devtas. And Vishnu told Khyati, he's a terrible demon. If you protect him, tomorrow he will destroy you. He will destroy the gods. He will, he will break havoc in the universe, he said. He said, let her. He said, Give him to us. He said, no, I'll not give it to him. He says, no, he's a demon. He is simply using you right now. So Vishnu talked again and again and again with her. But when she was not able to listen, and this demon would have slipped away and he would have wrecked the work. He had already killed thousands and thousands of people. So finally, Ram had to do the, not Ram, Vishnu, what he did, Vishnu is the Supreme Lord. 
And even if somebody is killed at his hands, they get liberated. So because Khyati was not ready to stop, so Ram wished to use mystic powers and silence Khyati. And then he killed this demon. And then when Rugu came, Rugu thought, Rugu felt that Khyati has been killed by Vishnu. And he cursed Vishnu at that time. He says, says, I have been separated from my wife, you will be separated from your wife when you descend. Madhacharya describes another story that in his, uh, in his, in the Mahabharata Nirnaya, that there is a demon who was, now this, so many demons are very cunning. They want immortality. And we know Hiranyakashi Pohi asked, either inside nor outside, nor day nor night, nor human nor animal. Uh, nobody should be able to kill me like that. So there was a demon who prayed to the Devata Shubrahma and he said, I, that I should never be killed as long as. Lakshmi and Narayan are united. <laughs> now Lakshmi and Narayan, he thought we'll never be separated. And that's why I'll never be killed. <laughs> so what he did was, he asked the prediction, he thought it was very clever. But the Lord Narayan is cleverer than everyone else. So then when he descended as Ram to this world, then in Ram and Sita, when they got separated, that was the time when Indra attacked this demon. And Indra fought against this demon and it was a very powerful demon. And finally, Indra killed the demon. And after Indra killed the demon, that's when Ram called Sita back. Uh, Sita had been in the forest for a long time. Love Kush had already been born. And Ram called Sita back at that time. And the last point is first I talked about selflessness. The last point is related with that. It is sacrifice. Sometimes this uh, story is used to talk about how you know, Sita was so much injustice was done and in India women are so much exploited, abused, neglected. But actually this interpretation, it does injustice to the character of Sita. Sita is a very strong, powerful woman. And when this happened, and Sita was sent away by Ram. Naturally, initially, she was shattered. But eventually, she understood why Ram is doing this. And she accepted it. She never blamed Ram for it. So actually, this was a, this was a sacrifice which both Sita and Ram did together. And rather than seeing Ram as unfair and Ram sending Sita away, uh, we have to see if at all anybody is to be, if there's any comparison, the comparison between Sita and Ram is similar to the comparison earlier between the situation of Sita and Ram is like the situation earlier of Ram and Dashrath. When Dashrath had to exile Ram, it was not that he did it out of pleasure. He did not do it out of reputation. He did it out of obligation. He had to honor his word. And when he did that, Dashrath himself was distressed and Ram was also distressed. But Dashrath did it stoically, Ram did it stoically. So just that Dashrath and Ram had a mood of sacrifice. In doing something, although it was very difficult. Similarly, Ram and Sita had that mood of sacrifice. And that is why this mood of sacrifice is so vital in every relationship. In every relationship, sometimes we have to do something which the which inspires the other which is which is required for the other person, although it is, you know, we may not like it. It may not please us. This if we consider broadly speaking, India has one of the strongest family structures in the world. In the Western world, the family structures are collapsing quite a bit. So, and for India, Ramayana is probably the most defining book. The Bhagavad Gita is important, the Bhagavad Gita is always the more philosophical book. The Mahabharata is there, but Mahabharata is, did not influence the Indian mind as much as the Ramayana. So, if Ram were simply an irresponsible, whimsical man 
who abandoned his wife when she was pregnant. Then how could inspiration from such a book inspire such a strong family culture and ethos within India? It is because the specifics are not to be replicated. The, the important thing is the principle. The, the specific is, did Ram suspect Sita and this sort of suspicious, small suspicion abandoned her? No, that, there's a whole context to that. And that specific was Ram in a very extraordinary difficult way, and even Sita in an extraordinary difficult way, demonstrating the universal principle of sacrifice. And that principle of sacrifice is what we are meant to internalize. Not in the same specific way, but in the way in which is required in our situation. So that way, the Ramayana inspires us with the mood of sacrifice. And that sacrifice is what strengthens relationships. So Ram's efforts, sending Sita away is actually an act of responsibility both on the part of Ram and on the part of Sita. It's an extreme example that is never to be imitated. But the essential mood of sacrifice is extraordinary. And in our own small ways, that mood is to be internalized in our life. So thank you very much.